O oh God, give us eyes to see new, ears to hear fresh, a heart to be warmed, and a spirit to be transformed, so that we might not leave this place ever the same. Amen. What does church mean to you? Perhaps it is a place of restoration and redemption. Or in the midst of life's chaos, it is a place of rest and respite before embarking on another long week. Or even still, it is a place to socialize and congregate. Church has taken on a plethora of meanings across the generations, each of them shaping in one way or another what we come to understand as church. But in the same breath, the studies and articles have reflected for as long as I can remember, the church is dying. So one must wonder, can the church be saved? Is it too late? Or as we hear the words of John's gospel this morning, maybe the church isn't dying, but rather is having an identity crisis. We come to an interesting story within the life of Jesus, one of the rare moments that finds its home across all four Gospels. And while Matthew, Mark, and Luke place this encounter shortly after Jesus' triumphal entry, John takes us back to the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, shortly after he calls his disciples. The first of three times that Jesus will take this pilgrimage to the holy city. He celebrates Passover with other faithful Jews from across the region. While Jesus' commute was not too long, only about 100 miles, which is basically just out the back door, others were on the road for multiple days and nights. But as Jesus and the disciples arrived at the temple complex, perhaps to engage in the pre-festival purification rituals, the sight was truly one to behold. To his left, he saw merchants selling sheep, cattle, and doves, three of the most common sacrifices at the temple. One might wonder, why didn't these pilgrims bring these sacrifices with them? But you can ask any pet owner that traveling with any animal over a lengthy period of time is a logistical nightmare. To his right, he sees money changers sitting at their tables as pilgrims exchange the Roman money bearing the image of Caesar into the temple currency that bore no human likeness. All around the temple contacts, the crowds were insane, to say the least. In our modern equivalent, think like Target whenever a new Stanley Tumblr is released. <laughs> or any airport during the holidays, any road during the holidays, or in the case of church, a fellowship time whenever someone decides to bring Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> so as you look out at the temple complex, see all of this hustle and bustle and business happening, you can imagine the rage that overtook the face of Jesus in that moment. Outraged at what the house of God has become during this most sacred of holidays. So Jesus swings into action, no pun intended. He makes himself 
a whip of cords from what he could find and makes a beeline directly towards the boots, whipping the cord back and forth. John tells us that as Jesus clears out the temple, all of the animals scatter in every direction. The bags of coins hurled into the sky tumble across the ground as he turns the tables over one by one. Everyone scurrying for their lives, the merchants barely making it out without any physical scratches, but certainly mental ones. So one wonders, why, why is Jesus doing this? As he explained to those selling the doves, they have desecrated the temple. Stop making my father's house a marketplace, Jesus exclaims. The temple is no ordinary building where economic transactions were permissible, even during Passover. The temple is the place where God dwells, and it is supposed to be kept holy. And in the coming years after the resurrection, the disciples will remember a scripture from the 69th Psalm, where the psalmist writes, Zeal for your house will consume me. Even while it appears on the surface that Jesus is blaspheming against the very God who he says to worship, Jesus' dedication to reforming the worship of God is at the heart of what drove him in this moment. Jesus' zeal is what will consume him at the hands of those who he says are the true blasphemers of the faith. And it will be this dynamic that will set the course for the whole of John's gospel. As our text closes, Jesus has this encounter with the Jews, an all-encompassing group for John that begins in the 18th verse. Knowing that Jesus is cleansing the temple took place under the watchful eye of the Roman legions, and any demonstration would be met swiftly by imperial action. One would surmise that the Jews in our text are coming to Jesus to prevent things from getting any worse. They say they want to see a sign that can explain for them why Jesus has done what he did. But in reality, they just want to attack Jesus just one more time. But Jesus responds with a sign. A sign that we too see as we approach Easter and all that is to come to pass. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. In the spirit of John's double meaning in his text, he is explaining something that is missed by those that are declared and seen as the outsiders. For the Jewish opposition think that Jesus is talking about the physical temple being destroyed. The one that has been under construction since Herod the Great began renovations 46 years ago. They are thinking about the Temple of Stone, which serves as the backdrop of this entire encounter, but Jesus is referring to the temple of his body. Jesus is referring to that very place where God dwells will be no more. In this very city, they will destroy Jesus' physical 
body. But in his response, he is also asserting that he will have the final say and victory. His disciples, in recalling this encounter, would remember Jesus foreshadowing his death and resurrection, further cementing their beliefs in their Savior and their Redeemer. Friends, I ask the question again, what does church look like for us in the present day? Has the present day church lost its divine occupant? Or did we just lock God in the attic and keep banging on the ceiling telling God to keep quiet up there? Has church become more like a marketplace and less than a place for ministry? One thing I can be confident of just from conversations with colleagues and friends from across the country, is that there are many of our siblings in Christ who hear the words of Jesus and scoff at the thought of church being anything but a marketplace. Certainly scoffing thinking of church as a house of prayer. As I shared last week, there are some whose minds are not set on divine things, but human. And I continue in that spirit by saying that there are some houses of worship that are far more comfortable continuing to make the house of God a marketplace. There are churches, and I use the term very loosely, that are long overdue for Jesus to pass through with the whip of cords and turn things over. There are churches and leaders that have and are currently focused more on making money than making disciples. That are focused more on profiting off of the gospel than proclaiming the gospel which is called to prosper in our hearts, that focus more on charging for faithfulness instead of changing lives, that focus more on looking holy from the outside instead of being holy on the inside that focus more on maintaining the look of a country club instead of looking and being a place of communal transformation, that focus and are intentional about not afflicting the comfortable instead of comforting the afflicted. Dare I say that there are churches that are far more worried about their physical buildings still standing than their congregations surviving. And so as I thought about how we are called to restore the church, we must look and assess its very foundation. Does the church participate in what God is doing locally and globally? Does the church impact the world, and if so, does it impact for good? Is the church truly transformative seven days a week, or just for an hour and change on Sunday morning? May we make the church a place where all feel and all are welcome because we are all pilgrims on this life's journey. May we make the church a place where justice is proclaimed and love is embodied. May we make the church a place 
where we work together and not against one another. May we make the church a place where people can find calm and not chaos, healing and not harm, vitality and not viciousness. May we make the church a place where we collaborate and not compete with our sister communities of faith, no matter what denominational umbrella they stand under. May we make the church truly one body. As we come to this table in a few moments, we are reminded that Jesus has called us all as the one body from across all of the households of faith to commune here. Like the pilgrims who have traveled from near and far, we too have come from great distances to receive the bread and cup, where we are reminded of Christ's call to each of us to proclaim the gospel message that Christ has died Christ has risen and Christ will come again. Through this table, we are strengthened and reminded that we are to be the church that follows and models Jesus, for that is the church that will last. So may we approach this table and go forth into the world, being the church that truly follows Jesus. Because that, friends, is a church that can and never will be destroyed. Amen.